Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Supervisor Matt Lavere. I have the privilege of representing the first district here on the Board of Supervisors. And on behalf of the uh, entire board, uh, I want to welcome all of you to our home. Uh, I know it's a place that Assemblymember Bennett knows very well. And I think I want to start off today by, by recognizing the fact that that little sprinkle of rain we got today, don't let it fool you. We are still in an extreme drought. And that is why I'm so appreciative and want to thank Assemblymember Bennett and Senator Lamone uh, for organizing this incredibly important forum uh, on an issue which I know we all care deeply about and something that's going to impact all of our lives uh, for the next five, 10, and probably more years. Uh, the individuals behind me are, are true subject matter experts. And this is going to be, I believe, a very insightful forum, a very informative forum. And uh, I'm glad that all of you are taking the initiative to be here to really educate yourselves on, on the future of water in Ventura County. And with that, I just want to say again, thank you to Assemblymember Bennett, Senator Limon. And with that, I'd like to bring up uh, Senator Mon uh, Monique Lamont. Thank you, Supervisor Levere. And thank you all for being here. Uh, certainly, uh, prolonged drought is one of the issues and more important issues that we are facing in the state of California, but also um, really in, in our country as, as we see the impacts of climate change. Uh, drought is currently impacting 98% of the state, and more than 44% 40 of California is in an exceptional drought. Uh, and for Ventura County, July, this July has been, this last July was uh, the hottest and driest on record. And so certainly um, it's impacted the way that we think about the way that we live, the way that we do the work, um, but it also has an impact on the economy, it has an impact on our community and on agriculture. Uh, where here in the state of California, we've really thought long and hard about what are the things that we can do and what kinds of resources we can invest in this particular issue. Um, and I wanna recognize that our state um, committed $1.2 billion um, to immediate drought support, including $280 million uh, to support grants for farming and related businesses impacting, uh, impacted by the drought, as well as an additional um, amount of money that's a deferred allocation for later in time uh, for long-term water resilience. So we're thinking both the short-term and the long-term at the state level, and we will continue to make state investments um, as we uh, have them available and as, as we are able to uh, allocate in appropriate way. I'm thankful to all of the panelists um, who I've had the opportunity to work with over the years, um, um, who are here, who are subject matter experts that really can uh, lend an expertise and an understanding specific to our county uh, on this particular issue. And for me, it's also really important that I recognize my counterpart uh, in Sacramento, who is really one of the lead thought leaders on water issues as we move forward. Uh, and he's been thinking about this not just in relation to his role in the Senate. Um, when I got elected to the State Assembly uh, six years ago, uh, he brought me on to do conversations with our local water municipalities. Some of you may remember those conversations here. Um, and so he's really been thinking long and hard about what we do in our community um, and for Ventura County as it relates to water and some of the challenges we've had to uh, with uh, the drought, in particular to Ventura County. So please help me in welcoming um, uh, Assemblymember Steve Bennett, who has championed this particular conversation and who's a thought leader um, really in our state of California on this particular issue. Assemblymember Bennett. Well, first I just want to say good evening to all of you uh, for being here. Um, it, uh, we have hundreds of people that say, claim they're watching this also online. But uh, with the NFL kicking off tonight, the Rams versus the Bills, I've already had a number of my friends say they're gonna be watching us during the advertisements. So, um, uh, but for you to take the time to be here today is reinforcing for all of us that are trying to work on this issue to know that this is one of the important issues and to have essentially a full boardroom and hundreds of people that again said they're, they're gonna be here online. So thank you for being here. Uh, second, I wanna thank uh, Matt um, and it was, uh, on a sad note, we lost Carmen Ramirez, but it was Carmen Ramirez who um, 
reached out and we were having our original conversations about doing something with the county and, and, uh, and the state and uh, continuing some of the things that we've been doing. So I uh, want to thank uh, Matt for uh, filling in uh, in terms of Carmen's place. And then Senator Lamone has been right there. And I just, politics is a team sport. And the bigger your team and the better your team, the more likely you are to get things done. And there is just nobody that is a better teammate uh, for Ventura County for me to have up in Sacramento than, than Senator Lamone. So I really appreciate uh, you guys being here. And now I'm already um, starting to go over my uh, time limit. Uh, and uh, or and getting myself off schedule, um, but uh, I do think it's really important to get those those appreciations out there. And I look forward to and I get to said I look forward to working with um, Supervisor Lavere and uh, Senator Lamone as we do more of these things uh, in the future. Um, we really appreciate our panelists. They do not have to be here tonight. They could be watching the Rams versus the, the Bills, um, but they are, they care about this issue, uh, and it means a lot to us to have all of these experts from around the state and here in Ventura County. So I'm gonna introduce all of them quickly because we're really trying to stay on time and make sure we get everything covered that uh, we have on our agenda today. And so if you'll hold your applause until I get to all of them, and then if we'll give them a real warm welcome and appreciation for being here. And if you'll just put your hand up, panelists, when I call your name, Jeff Pratt, Director of Public Works, Kim, Kim Lowe, both Ventura County Public Works, and today, tonight he represents the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. Janine Jones, Interstate Resources Manager for the California Department of Water Resources. That's our state of California representative here. Gina Dorrington, General Manager, City of Ventura Water Department. Omar Castro, Water Division Manager, City of Oxnard Public Works Department. Jacqueline McMillan, PR Governmental Affairs and Regional Representative of Metropolitan's um, Water District. Um, uh, Anthony Goff, Tony, all right, the General Manager of Cayagas uh, Municipal Water District. I'm sorry, that's my chair, all right? Yeah, you, you can't have it, right? There you go, all right? Um, Michael Flood, General Manager, Casitas uh, Municipal Water District. Um, and Mauricio Gordado, uh, and he's the General Manager of the United Water Conservation District. How about a big hand of appreciation? So quick, quick agenda review. We're going to hear from the state of California's representative, a kind of an overview of where the state is to put, the, put, put our situation in context. Then we're gonna hear from Jeff Pratt, who probably has some, some of the longest and deepest overall knowledge about what's going on with water in Ventura County. Um, and as I mentioned, in his, in his role as a public works director for the County of Ventura. Then we're gonna hear from Kim Loeb, who is going to talk about Fox Canyon. Fox Canyon is the groundwater management agency that manages the water under essentially all of the Oxnard Plain, all the way from Camarillo up to Fillmore, uh, out to the edges of the city of Ventura. Huge aquifer, very important resource. After that, uh, we will then uh, go to the water districts and agencies, uh, each of the water districts and agencies. Um, and each water district and agency, because we have so many people here, they're going to be limited to five minutes for the first half of their presentation, where they're going to give you an overview of their water district, what their situation is right now, what kind of infrastructure they have, who's running their districts. And then we're going to sweep back through a second time with those water districts, and they're going to talk about what resources they have for the citizens of Ventura County to help them with conservation, to help them deal with the water crisis, and then they're going to end their presentation with a couple of minutes on what are the longer term solutions that their particular agency is working on. After, when we finish that, hopefully that'll be 7.31, and then we'll have 29 minutes left for questions because we're going to go to 8 o'clock instead of 7.45. So I hope that works for everybody, and I hope that we can stay on schedule. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to make one final comment before I start, and that is water is easily one of the most emotional issues that we have in Ventura County. Um, and uh, tonight we have what I would call guest here on behalf of my office, Senator Lamone's office, Supervisor Lavere's office. And so tonight is not a time to do gotcha with anybody. 
either amongst the panelists or this way. What we want to do is try to get all the information out. There's another time for us to have all of our water fights, and we will probably have plenty of those uh, as we go down the road. But I'm just going to ask everybody, this is about information gathering and trying to think and maybe be even creative and think about creative things. And you can't do that if you feel like you're under attack or if you're planning on attacking. So I will be pretty firm about trying to make sure that doesn't happen. We already have this fairly so full that there isn't going to be much room or time for you guys to do anything too disruptive. But um, if, uh, uh, if that happens, I just want to get that out there. Or if the panelists start to, to throw snowballs at each other and stuff. So, um, so with that, let me just uh, do my overview um, of sort of water, California, Ventura County. Um, and then we'll go, go from there. Uh, and that is um, water in, in the state of California has been a historical evolution. Think about it. The miners came here. The 49ers came here. They needed water for their mining operations. They started to have fights over water. And the law became whoever got here first had priority. And that has been established in California now for a long period of time. That means that we've evolved with very fragmented water policies in the state of California. Essentially, everybody just, if you needed water, you found local water here, and somebody found local water there and, and there. In some of the newer settled areas, bigger areas, Thousand Oaks, some of those places, they have big water agencies because they plan some big development, et cetera. But it means we have fragmentation of the authority over water in California. We also have fragmentation in terms of the laws. Some of the laws that are on the books were designed for old days, like I mentioned, the gold rush kind of days. Um, and some of the laws have been settled in court. Maybe back in the 1920s, there would be a court ruling. And then it would sort of sit there off the books and, and not be tested, et cetera. So we have a really important policy with a whole lot of fragmentation which does not make it easy to try to figure out how we're going to move forward because you have to do some kind of coordination. And of course, when you have fragmentation and you have lots of different people and lots of people's incomes are dependent upon their particular water district, they either work for that water district or they're dependent upon that water district, what you generally have in that situation is competition, not cooperation. And that's been the history of California water to a large extent. There's been a lot of competition. Think about Los Angeles deciding to hoodwink the people in the Owens Valley, go up, purchase up all that land so that they could get that. That was a pure old-fashioned water fight, right? Um, and uh, it's not the kind of thing that builds sort of the collaborative approach that today we need uh, as we go forward. Um, the other th observation I would make is up till about 2020, up till about two or three years ago, my interactions with water districts, et cetera, too often was, you know, it's the drought. The drought will be over with, and then our, our reservoirs will fill back up. Our groundwater will recharge. Uh, the state water projects start to deliver in, and we'll all be fine. But I think we all recognize climate change has changed the rules there. We are can't prove it. We are almost certainly in aridization rather than climate change, a fundamental change in the water supply in California, particularly Southern California. And that means a fundamental change in water demand. As things get drier, it changes how we use water and what we do. Also a fundamental change in the water ecology uh, that is out there. Now, the Colorado, and, and let me identify some of the things that I think helped cause that change. And that is Colorado River. Now people are starting to say Colorado River just can't continue to do what it's been doing. And it's changing the way that we in Southern California have to depend upon the Colorado River moving forward. Same thing is true um, with the Sierra Nevada snowpack. Because of climate change, we don't have the snowpack that we used to have. And as a result, uh, we don't have the state water project as reliable as it once was. But of all of the things, groundwater is the most complicated. It's the most complicated because it's out of sight. You can't actually see it. You got the reservoir at Lake Casitas. People call all the time. What are we going to do about Lake Casitas? People don't call and say, what are we going to do about Fox Canyon? They, you can't see it. You can't see the groundwater basin in, in Ojai, et cetera. You also can't see how many straws. You could see more pipes going into to Lake Casitas. You, you would, if you saw 600 more pipes going in, you'd have a whole lot of people calling our offices, elected officials would. But 600 new wells going in the groundwater, mm, not that many people are going to be, be aware of that, right? The other thing about groundwater is that uh, groundwater 
refills at different rates depending on the basin. If you're underneath a river, you've got a basin that likely, not always, but likely recharges pretty quickly. If you're further away from the basin, uh, like on the uh, Fox Canyon, like under Santa Clara River, Ventura River, those basins recharge quicker. Farther away you are from the Santa Clara River, the harder it is for Fox Canyon to be able to recharge. Um, just to give you a, a broad perspective, back in the 1880s, you could pop, put, a, put a pipe in the ground, and if you hit a, a water basin, you could have enough pressure to service a two-story house with no pump or anything. That's how full the Fox Canyon groundwater basin was, uh, the basins in Fox Canyon were at that point in time. A hundred years later, in the 1980s, the state of California recognized we had saltwater intrusion because we had pumped the groundwater below the level of the ocean, and that saltwater intrusion was going to at risk polluting all of this millions of gallons of fresh water that we have in that basin. And they created the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency, which we're going to hear about uh, uh, today. Um, the um, Find my place here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk like Hubert Humphrey. Um, so that uh, I make sure I stay on time, right? Um, so there we go. Uh, so we have the real risk of Lake Casitas literally running out of water, going to stage five, almost being dry. We have the real risk of the State Water Project never ever supplying water like it used to supply water to Southern California. And we have the real risk of our groundwater basins not ever being able to recharge back to the levels that they were even uh, 30 or 40 years ago, much less all the way back to the, back to the 1880s. So a couple other things about how things have changed, uh, and, and that is that the sense of urgency, I believe, just wasn't there before 2020 in my mind. But now there is more of a sense of urgency. I'm not sure we would have gotten this many people in 2018, 2016, if we would have had one of these water forum meetings. Um, the second thing is democracies just don't handle short-term pain for long-term gain very well. You just can't sell that as an elected official, right? You know, let's sacrifice a little bit now so we don't have to sacrifice a lot later. Just it's, it's not, it doesn't drive people to the polls, right? Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't make a, a great sound bite. Um, and so with this change, um, we have to, I think, seize this moment. Uh, and otherwise, we're going to have significant economic, political, and lifestyle changes for us here. If Lake Casitas goes dry, if we can't uh, recharge the groundwater, uh, we're going to have problems as we move forward. So I appreciate that Senator Lamone covered uh, what the state has been doing uh, in terms of moving on that, and we're happy to fill you in more on that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish with this, and that is I'm not on during the presentations on long-term solutions, so I want to address when it comes to long-term solutions to our situation, they basically come down to two basic categories, water efficiency conservation over here or come up with new supplies of water uh, over there. Um, there's, hopefully tonight we're gonna hear a lot about both of those things. I just wanna offer one area that I've been working on all the way back to 1992. In 1992, Tim Downey and myself ran the political campaign for an advisory vote in the city of Ventura whether we should build state water, uh, connect to state water, or connect to desal. And our position was desal was gonna be a much more long-term reliable solution at the time. 55% of the citizens of Ventura voted for the desal project, but the city chose not to actually build it after the advisory vote came in. They also chose not to connect to the state water project at that point in time. I would point out now today, by the way, Santa Barbara had the same thing on the ballot, only it wasn't advisory. They had, do you want to build to connect to state water? Do you want to connect to desal? And the citizens of Santa Barbara voted for both. And Santa Barbara literally had to, con had to build the state water connection and desal. The advantage state Santa Barbara has is their desal plant was built when restrictions were much easier. And so Santa Barbara now has a functioning desal plant and it's become much harder. I have asked for and won a million dollars in the state budget so that the Coastal Commission can identify where are the best places to permit desalinization on the coast of California. Because we have to find a way 
for moderate-sized desal plants, not the big giants, but the moderate-sized desal plants for these for coastal communities like Ventura and Oxnard to be able to build desal and um, not have it take 12 or 15 years to get it done. So that's a goal that uh, I am working on tonight. And again, I want to thank everybody. Um, uh, we'll, we'll hold, hold your applause. I'm on time here, right? Um, again, I, I want to thank you guys for being here. We won't get everything covered tonight. It'll be frustrating for all of us. It's been frustrating for me to be uh, moving at, at this pace, but we will be disciplined in terms of holding people to their time. Um, and uh, we'll have these follow-up meetings because literally uh, our lives depend on water here in Southern California. Thank you very much. The time, mine says only 14 minutes. My timer here told me my time was up, but I wanted to show her that I made it in 14 minutes and 37 seconds. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over um, to our first speaker, and that is um, uh, Janine Jones from the state, uh, from the state of California, uh, Department of Water Resources. And we gave Janine a series of questions that we wanted her to address, and she has a PowerPoint. Uh, and Janine, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Assembly Member, and I'm glad to see so many people think that water is more interesting than a Rams game. So if we could go ahead and queue up the PowerPoint, someone? Well, I'll go ahead and start talking, and hopefully they will... Okay, there we go. So um, drought in the statewide perspective. So this is where we are in terms of precipitation right now statewide this year. And there's a lot of red on the map, but at least it's better than last year. So hold that thought. In terms of reservoir storage statewide, again, we are somewhat better than we were last year, which was extraordinarily warm and dry. And the good news is that we have learned from past droughts. Go back to 1977 and see how much better we have managed our systems to conserve water uh, during even very dry and challenging times. And obviously we're looking back at the last number of years, including a couple of the years from our last drought in this slide. And of course, in this part of the world, groundwater is very important. I'm showing here uh, just a one-year change in groundwater levels. And with groundwater, it really is about where you draw the free body diagram. If we did this on a 10-year period or a five-year period, you'd see a lot more red dots, which is not a good thing, because we have been relying very heavily on our groundwater in much of the state, especially in the southern San Joaquin Valley. But this is where we are as of right now. So with respect to California's water supplies, as we know, we move water all over the place, because where the water comes from and where the people live and the agriculture is, don't necessarily line up. So not only do we have this extensive system of surface water that in this part of the world even brings in supplies from the State Water Project in the Colorado River Basin, but we also have a big reliance on groundwater, especially in drought years. And where you are in the state really influences where your water supply comes from and how it's used. So for example, on the North Coast, they're very reliant on surface supplies, and there's a very high percentage of environmental water use because that's primarily surface water. Here in Southern California, in Ventura County, uh, very low, relatively speaking, environmental water use because the surface water resources are not that great and a lot more reliance on groundwater. And obviously in the eastern part of the county, you can bring in the imported water from Metropolitan Water District but as you go farther west, you are looking at groundwater territory. So if we look at droughts, something that really stands out, and the ones in red are more severe hydrologically here, uh, notice we've had a lot of droughts in the current century in comparison to prior centuries. And generally, we've been, over this long-term period, leaning drier in the latter part of it. And we can see that relatively well if we look at a graph of statewide runoff. And interesting to note that the slope of the um, smoothed curve there uh, is very steeply going downhill, and we have a lot of dry periods uh, in our more recent historical period. And we know that drought is being exacerbated by climate change. And we can really see, and we use this century for the sake of convenience and talking, but we can really see the influence of warming temperatures on drought. And definitely the impacts in this drought and the 2012-16 drought 
not the same as our 20th century drought. And oh, by the way, some of you may recognize the top photo there. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's a large reservoir in Santa Barbara County. Oh, well, oops, it was a large reservoir. It just doesn't happen to have any water in it in that picture. I'm referring, of course, to Lake Kachuma. Uh, in our last drought, we set a number of firsts that were not good firsts. Um, and unfortunately, we are seeing similar kinds of impacts going forward in this drought, and notably uh, a CVP health and safety allocation to M&I contractors for the first time. And we were flirting with and are almost at an M&I allocation for the state water project. We only have a 5% allocation on the state project this year, and obviously the Colorado River. Uh, as was mentioned. And speaking of the Colorado River, that's Lake Powell. Well, oops, that was Lake Powell. But obviously we've seen an unprecedented decline in Colorado River levels, and that's very important for us, especially in Southern California, because the Colorado River has been historically our most reliable drought supply, basically because of the very large volume of storage there. And something else that's changing, catastrophic wildfire risk. And for the first time, we are seeing impacts, significant impacts, to larger urban water systems. Who would have thought that the city of Santa Rosa, which doesn't normally strike many people as a huge wildfire risk area, would have lost a big chunk of its city distribution system and basically delayed people being able to move back in for a year plus just for the decontamination of the urban water system and we are now seeing this at other uh, locations. And by the way, the picture at the bottom, that's Lake Oroville. Um, and two years ago, both Lake Oroville and power plant, uh, our big power plant, Hyatt Power Plant at Oroville, and the Bureau's Keswick uh, Power Plant had precautionary evacuations of the power plant staff because of wildfire. And a few years before that, the Hetch Hetchy system had major damage to their um, facilities, their um, power plant up in the uh, uh, Yosemite area. So definitely we are seeing changes here, and we have you know, tabulated these changes and reported on them to the legislature. And obviously we have a lot of experience in drought. One of the things that we know is that large urban water agencies, because they have more resources, you know, more ratepayers, more budget, do a really good job generally of managing droughts but small water systems are really at risk, and a lot of our state assistance during droughts is really focused on helping the smallest of the small and people on private wells. So, for example, we have a lot of financial assistance resources. Thank you very much, members of the legislature. We had some uh, drought grants that began last year. And once again, more money put into those grants this year. And a lot of that is really going for these emergency assistance programs, like the picture at the bottom, which is uh, in the Sacramento Valley of all places, which normally isn't as affected uh, by droughts. We are seeing widespread areas of private wells where we are responding with hauled water and tanks at individual residences. And uh, for those of you interested in the State Water Project, the top picture is the emergency salinity barrier that we put in place to allow us to better control salinity in the delta without having to release water from the upstream reservoirs to do so. So what about the coming water year? Well, I hate to tell you this, but the scientific skill is just not there to do forecasts of precipitation at longer lead times. And this is something we would very much encourage the federal government to uh, put some resources to and do the research. We do know that this is a third La Nina year, and there are only two other three-year La Ninas in the historical record. So we don't have a lot of um, uh, analogs to go on here. But one thing we can say about ENSO conditions in California is that La Nina is usually dry in Southern California. But from a practical standpoint, from a statewide perspective, we have to assume that year four, the coming year, will be dry and plan accordingly because the stakes are you know, too high not to do that. And just pointing out, this is the historical skill of NOAA's long-term forecasts. White areas on the map mean no skill. Okay, uh, yes. We can see that California and the Colorado River Basin have no skill. So uh, getting to something the assembly member mentioned, this is the way we've historically thought about drought. It happens once in a while. 
you respond to it, you know, you run around like a chicken with your head cut off, and then it's over and you forget about it. Well, that's not where we're where we are now. We are shifting to a warmer and drier climate in the long term, and we have to think about what's necessary to prepare for this. And this is why the governor recently released this um, portfolio of actions talking about the need for more water recycling projects, more conservation, more desal, just to respond to these kind of situations. So thank you. Wow. A, a, a ton of information presented very concisely. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Janine will be back on again um, uh, with the second half of the program. Whoa, this is the wrong presentation. <laughs> this is the second one. This is going to be added is what the assembly member said. We're looking at ways of decreasing demand and increasing uh, supplies. Um, I almost didn't include this, but I thought I should just in case. I didn't know uh, the level here. But there's some important things to note. Like the state, um, the precipitation rainfall in Ventura County, we keep the record, we go back to 1870, is on a steady decline over that period of time. Um, and that's very important for some of the watersheds, which I'll talk about in a moment, because they're entirely dependent on the local precipitation. Another big thing on this is the seawater intrusion. The seawater intrusion in the Oxnard Plain has been known since at least the 1940s. In 1955, the county uh, studied the possibility of nearshore desal um, and um, then handed it over to others. Ocean desal has always been a question, uh, but as the assembly member mentioned, it's so tough that uh, lower hanging fruit are what we're going after first. So with that, I'll move to the watersheds. These are the major watersheds in Ventura County, and watersheds can be divided as finely as you like, but this is the way we divide them. The three that we're going to spend the most time on in my presentation are the Ventura, Santa Clara, and the Cayagas. Each of those uh, corresponds to a different wholesaler here tonight, and they're going to talk about their areas in a lot more detail. But um, the reason I put these up is because they're all different. In one case, um, it's a, a lot, there's a lot of dependency on the state water project um, and metropolitan. In another case, they're entirely independent of the state water system. All of these have a groundwater dependencies. Something else you should realize, as you move east in the county, generally you get less rain. As you move north in the county, generally you get less rain. And the temperature increases as you move east and north. And that's important to the hydrologic cycle. Many places in Ventura County are agriculture, and those agricultural folks can grow crops at, at three different rotations a year. Here's the water demand by sector in Ventura County, um, and you see this is a, a snapshot in 2020. Ag, as across the state in our county, averages about 60%. In 2020, it was at 52, and M&I averages about 40%, as in the state. Ag can go as high as 70 and M&I as low as 30 in some years. This is the water supplies in Ventura County by source. 63% you know, of the water produced is groundwater. Surface water accounts for eight. Recycled water, four. And imported water, uh, whopping 25. Um, Simi, and, uh, Simi Valley and uh, Thousand Oaks are almost entirely dependent on state water, or excuse me, metropolitan water, state water. Cayagas. Moore Park, Camarillo, Oxnard, and Port Wanimi um, uh, use imported water plus groundwater. Fillmore and Piru are ground, uh, groundwater dependent. Ventura and Ojai are, um, are local supply only. And I should have said Fillmore and Santa Paula are groundwater dependent. Here's how water is used uh, by watershed. And you can see in the Ventura River watershed, it's 73% comes from surface water. That's the watershed that is entirely or almost entirely dependent upon precipitation. 24% of the use comes from groundwater, some of it from the Fox Canyon Basin. Um, by contrast, Santa Clara River watershed, 82% comes from groundwater with uh, very little imported water use. Um, and then in Cayagas Creek, you can see it's about an even split between groundwater and imported water. This is um, an amazing story in a lot of respects in that um, um, groundwater use has gone down from 1992 to 2020, um, slightly, 
while the population has jumped by almost 200,000 folks. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you see that recycled water use is increasing over time. Surface water has gone down over time. Imports gone down over time. And groundwater has gone down over time. Um, I think some of the reason that we've gone down is there's been a conversion of lag, ag land to m &I, which uh, m &I per acre uses a little bit less water than agriculture does. And then there's been conservation efforts by all, both agriculture and m &I users, which have accounted for that reduction in use, although there was an increase in population. Now, here are the water wholesalers. And water wholesalers, for those of you who don't know, are, are folks who uh, have water that they sell to others, the retailers. And the retailers can largely be thought of as M&I folks, i.e. cities and so forth. Um, the water wholesalers, by and large, correspond to each of the water sets. So you see Cayugas in the pink, rose-colored. Uh, you see United in the blue and Casitas in the green, roughly corresponding to each of the watersheds that I showed you before. That purple area is where um, the Cayugas service area overlaps the United service area. Um, here's a story that a lot of people don't know. Um, this is only a partial map of the water purveyors inside of Ventura County. There are over 150 of them countywide. They all have different rules and oversight folks, um, and it just depends on their size and function. There's no single clearinghouse for data or projects or a single place for collaboration on projects. This is some of the, the fractured nature of water management in Ventura County that the assembly member mentioned. We have several groundwater sustainability agencies, I, um, and we're talking about the major groundwater supplies. Um, there are several groundwater basins not shown here, but these are the major ones that DWR oversees. There are seven separate groundwater sustainability agencies. Those are agencies that are newly created, 2014, 2015, and overseen by the state. Um, we have one adjudicated basin. These represent the 12 major groundwater basins, and um, each of them have independent boards that act on the behalf of that groundwater sustainability agency. Um, it's, note, it's worth noting that some of these flow into others. They're cascading. You can think of them as cascading waterfalls or a cascading stream. Underground, but you can't see it. So what's the issue? Well, uh, we need to increase supply, reduce demand. And, and what happens in that middle box? And that's going to be discussed um, by others today. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Very I, I'm, in, I'm impressed with these uh, panelists being able to, to, to condense a lot of important information down and, and stay on time. I'm going to just mention two quick things. Uh, when people refer to M&I, oh. uh, municipal and industrial, they're, what they're referring to, municipal is just basically cities providing drinking water and, and water to hospitals and schools and all of that. Um, and industrial uh, would be people that are using water for industrial purposes. So there's M&I there and there's agriculture there. I also just want to really quickly, uh, before we move over there, is that groundwater, uh, some of this groundwater has built up over centuries, if not even longer, um, that we are, we've been tapping down. But that's uh, those are two, I think, helpful pieces of information. Meanwhile, other groundwater, again, recharges within a year or two. And Kim Loeb, I've just used up the last 40 seconds that Jeff left us for you. So you've got 12 minutes, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member Bennett. Um, so Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency, as Assembly Member uh, mentioned earlier, was created in early 80s to uh, manage the groundwater basins in the southwestern portion of the county uh, due to the seawater intrusion into the um, Oxnard subbasin. I'm going to go through briefly uh, some groundwater levels over time, talk a little about our, our groundwater sustain, sustainability plans, the challenges we have to moving ahead, and the opportunities and solutions. But first, uh, this is uh, historic rainfall measured in the Oxnard Basin from 1957 to uh, 2021. And what I want to point out is at the, uh, here we go, the last 10 years from 2012 on, you can see that we had five critically dry years, um, only a couple uh, above normal and no big wet years. And we're uh, 
really in a lot of ways that we're still in that same drought that started then. So we're going to talk mostly about the Oxnard subbasin in terms of water levels. And uh, um, basins in Fox Canyon have complex hydrogeology. And here in Oxnard, there are five groundwater aquifers. They're separated by clay layers. And we divide them into an upper aquifer system and a lower aquifer system. And here we're looking at water levels from the Oxnard aquifer, which is the topmost of the upper aquifer system. And first thing I look at is the numbers in bold. Those are measured groundwater elevations compared to sea level when measured in March of this year. And you can see they're below um, sea level, most of them, from 10 to 20 feet below. And water falls downhill. We have sort of an infinite source of water there in the Pacific Ocean. And it flows into the aquifers, bolsters up the water levels, but at the cost of um, salty contamination into those aquifers. Then we're showing hydrographs of some key wells in here. And uh, I know you can't see the scale in there, but the, on the horizontal axis, we're going from October 29, 1989 to uh, that March uh, 21 date. And there's a couple trends that are worth noting here. As we start out at the beginning, uh, somewhere is that cursor? There it goes. Um, we see the drought of 1990, and the water level's really low. Then we get up above, and we're pretty good here. We've got pretty good precipitation. Importantly, we have good uh, water available to be turned out. United has facilities to recharge there in uh, the forebay of the basin, very important for the uh, water, groundwater resources. And then we hit 2012, and bang, the water levels drop. We see a little bit of a blip up in, in 2019. And that's when we had uh, a little better year. We also had um, more water available on the Santa Clara River. And also Fox Canyon was able to uh, purchase some excess state water project water, 15,000 acre feet, which United was able to then uh, divert into their facilities, which helped bump it up. We're also seeing that red line there. That's the minimum threshold in our groundwater sustainability plan. And we need to keep the water levels above that line if we're going to address the seawater intrusion in this basin. And we have to get there by 2040. Moving down to the lower aquifer system in the Fox Canyon aquifer, the, the hydrographs look very much the same. The trends are the same. But if we look at the big, bold numbers, we can see that the depth of the, or the elevation of the groundwater is quite a lot deeper, um, generally ranging from nine to 80, nine feet in the forebay down to 88 feet um, in the center, an area of a pumping depression, and down to almost uh, 70 feet below uh, sea level down by Point Magoo uh, when measured in March. These maps from uh, were prepared by United, and they show the interpreted 2020 extent of seawater intrusion in the Oxnard Aquifer and in the Fox Canyon Aquifer, and uh, just kind of show the extent of the problem as uh, was inferred at that time. Moving on to management, uh, there has been discussion and mention of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA as we call it, uh, the most important water legislation in the state in 100 years. And for Fox Canyon, it's been in, uh, around for a long time, the SIGMA and adoption of groundwater sustainability plans gave us a very important new authority. For most of our uh, existence, we've only been able to work on the demand side through regulating groundwater extractions. Now we have the ability to work on the supply side to work on projects to improve the uh, uh, so water supply and sustainability and also uh, water purchases like we mentioned uh, just a minute ago. The groundwater sustainability plans have significant, tremendous amount of technical information about the basins, and they also identify uh, the undesirable results are occurring and what it's, is sustainability in the basins. And they're based on the best available science was available when we prepared them uh, in late 2019. They were approved by uh, Department of Water Resources, uh, some of the few in the state that were. And, uh, but these are not written in stone. SIGMA requires adaptive management, 
And that means that we will be looking at uh, reviewing these and updating them as needed. Uh, that process will probably start next year. Uh, that needs to happen at least every five years. Moving forward, there are a lot of challenges that we face. Uh, as Jeff talked about, uh, groundwater use, uh, as, and also the assembly member, uh, groundwater use is exceeding the sustainable building, uh, yield of the basins, which is causing undesirable results. And in Oxnard Subbasin, that's ongoing seawater intrusion. Much of the low-hanging fruit, as people like to say, has been picked. The easy, a lot of the easy stuff has been done, and there's a lot of uncertainty moving into the future. And while the climate change projections uh, don't show that there'll be significant reductions in the annual amount of precipitation in this area, when and how that comes is going to change quite a lot. And so we'll have these uh, really variable long periods of dry periods and then big wet periods. Or rainy, the rain will all come at once when it's much harder to manage and put to beneficial use. Uh, flows in Santa Clara River, that uncertainty about that, and of course the availability of state water. Um, projects are very important to moving forward, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty about them. So, uh, the feasibility of some of the big projects under consideration is not well known yet, and environmental uh, permitting restrictions is a big uh, uncertainty, especially in terms of the time frames of some of the big projects. And then the cost, the projects that are being discussed could be hundreds of millions of dollars. And there's uncertainty around how much groundwater users, uh, cost they can uh, bear in order to increase the water resources of the basins. However, there are uh, opportunities and solutions that we're already uh, in the process of implementing. Uh, projects, again, as we talked about, are very important. And in terms of water supply projects, recycled water cities are uh, amping up their use of recycled water. You probably hear about that today from some of the other panelists. Uh, brackish and saline uh, desalters, it's been mentioned. There is a uh, city Camarillo is operating a desalter in Pleasant Valley. Uh, United Water is uh, proposing a desalter at Point Magoo. And uh, imported water can be part of the picture uh, when there's excess available in those big years. We want to be ready to uh, bring it in to the area when it is available. Stormwater capture can play a role. Mitigation projects. And here that's principally we're talking about stormwater intrusion barriers. And United also is looking at uh, an extraction barrier at Point Magoo that will help to address the um, seawater intrusion in the upper aquifer system, and we're working with them to uh, in, work in feasibility of uh, some targeted injection wells to address that so seawater intrusion in the lower aquifer system as well. And um, infrastructure projects are very important. Uh, you saw uh, from Janine that all the piping and inner ties in the state well, within the basins, it's very important to be able to intertie the various types of water and have the flexibility to optimize where we use the water and where we pump. And uh, Fox Canyon was awarded uh, $15.2 million in grants from Department of Water Resources to implement projects and oversee that in Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins. And there, part of those projects are two uh, recycled intertie pipelines, one in Pleasant Valley um, that uh, Pleasant Valley County Water District will be building, and then one in the Oxnard Basin that United Water Conservation District will be building. In terms of management actions, stakeholder engagement is so very important. It's very been always very important to the Fox Canyon Board and to getting the buy-in uh, from the stakeholders and understanding of the, how we need to move forward in managing the basins and getting the... Um, the support for the projects that we need to build are critical. Regional partnerships, we've developed really strong regional partnerships with the other agencies, and we've all been working together to find these solutions to uh, bring our basins into long-term sustainable management. Uh, we have a water market pilot that provides um, the flexibility for pumpers to buy 
uh, groundwater pumping allocation on an annual by, uh, basis um, and sell that allocation to provide that flexibility. And then lastly, we do have um, the, uh, the tool of extraction reductions. And uh, if uh, the projects or if we're not able to implement the projects and fund them and, and build them in time and they're not addressing the sustainable, full sustainable uh, management of the basin, then we will have to look at reducing the amount of groundwater use that the pumpers are doing. So thank you very much. I'm going to mention a few things. Number one, um, these panelists are doing a great The red line uh, up there is the sustainable yield line, and you can see all of our wells are way below the red line. So we have to do something here uh, in the state. Now, uh, 2014, the law passed. 2022, all of these local agencies had to submit their plans. The majority of the plans submitted by the basins that are called critically overdrafted, like Ventura County, the majority of the plans were rejected um, because by the state saying, these, these are not plans, these are not adequate. To Ventura County's credit, to Fox Canyon's credit, their plan was accepted. Um, it doesn't mean that the state thinks it's a great plan. It means it's a, thought it at least passed the threshold of saying it's an adequate plan. They're still working on it, and, but it is being held up as, look, it can be done. Uh, to show that you, you can come up with a plan. So I think people in Fox Canyon ought to feel good about, it, about getting that first important step done uh, as we move forward. So um, the, uh, I'll, with that, uh, we'll move over now to our panelists. Um, and each panelist will be on, like I mentioned, for five minutes. Um, and they will uh, talk to us about uh, sort of an overview of their, uh, their uh, water district. And we're going to start with Gina Dorrington from the Ventura River, I mean, from the the City of Ventura's Water Department. Gina? All right. Thank you, Assemblymember um, Bennett. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Senator De Leon, as well. Um, right. So our service area is the City of Ventura, and um, we also have a couple incorporated areas along the West End um, on the Ventura Avenue and the East End in the Satakoy area. Uh, this is an overview of where our water supplies exist and a makeup of how our sources um, do our, uh, complete our total water supply, which is currently around uh, 17,000 acre feet. Uh, we pump from subsurface from the Ventura River. We uh, get deliveries from Lake Casitas. Uh, we pump from the Santa Paula Mound and Oxnard Plain basins, and we have a small portion of recycled water uh, provided by our, water waste, our wastewater treatment facility. Our water supply challenges are probably the same challenges you'll hear from all of these agencies this evening, um, finding um, that the change in climate is producing uh, more increased and um, longer durations of drought, and looking at um, depletions and allocations um, for our pumping and uh, environmental and legal challenges with our sources are keeping our water resources department um, continually looking for ways to augment and diversify our portfolio. This is an overview um, historically of the past 20 years and how we've utilized our sources, Lake Casitas being the bottom portion of the graph, the mid portion being Ventura River, and the upper portion our groundwater. And you can see the evolution, um, how we have shifted from a dependence on surface water and um, moved into more of a dependence on our groundwater basins. The, in, the important takeaway from this slide is actually backing up and taking a look at the overall um, reduction in demand. Uh, the city of Ventura and its customers have done an exceptional job over the past 20 years in um, taking on conservation as a way of life. And we have had a reduction since 2020 um, of about 35%. Um, so that is to be commended um, for our customers in the city of Ventura. Uh, we do several reporting um, tools to help us monitor and track our um, uh, demand and supply. We have our urban water management plan that we update every five years, as, along with an um, annual refinement in our comprehensive water resources report. And uh, currently, we are looking at our drought, our drought projections. Uh, the top line representing where we are in our projected drought supply for the um, next two years, and then where we are with our demand. 
Um, it's important to note that um, we are maintaining a buffer here between 19 and 21 percent, um, staying below our, su our supply level. And um, if Ventura continues to keep um, these conservation levels up, we are going to continue to meet the uh, state standards for urban water use efficiency. The biggest uh, challenge we faced this year was the adoption of the emergency drought regulations uh, by the State Water Resource Control Board um, in um, guidance with the governor's orders. Uh, we implemented our stage two uh, conservation efforts, which meant um, ramping up uh, awareness for our customers. We went out and hit social media, sent flyers, mailers. Um, we have continued to enforce our water waste ordinance, um, making sure that uh, we don't have any violators there. And we did a very big um, collaboration with our city parks department in ramping down irrigation and um, not irrigating those uh, uh, non-functional turf zones that have been mandated. All right, so I will turn it over to Omar. Um, so the city of Oxnard gets its water resources from imported water, uh, which is part of the state water project that we get uh, wheeled to us uh, that we purchase from Cayugas Municipal Water District, and that's about 34% of our water supply. The city uh, pumps its own groundwater. We have uh, 10 active wells. Uh, uh, it's on. Here, let me. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, so thirty percent of our water supply comes from our own groundwater wells. Uh, we operate ten um, active wells. Three of them that are actually desalter wells that run through our reverse osmosis plant, um, and we also purchase local groundwater from uh, United Conservation Water District. So Oxnard produces about 25 million gallons per day of safe and reliable drinking water to um, our over 200,000 customers. And our customers are comprised of residential, commercial, uh, institutional, and agricultural customers. Some of our agricultural customers do receive um, potable water, um, that is water that was purchased uh, through United, and we also run our advanced water purification facility, which we'll be talking about later, uh, that we feed some of our agricultural customers with. So current water supply, demand, and projections. This is part of our uh, chart that we pulled out of our uh, 2020 urban water management plan. We have to revise uh, every five years. Uh, the interesting part about this is if you look at 2024, we start projecting that we're gonna have uh, a decrease in demand from our local water resources, and that's pr primarily because we're gonna start utilizing um, our recycled water and um, aquifer storage and injection. Uh, let me see. Oops. So for our conservation efforts, um, there is no um, irrigation of non-functional turf. Um, this has been a, a very critical outreach for the city of Oxnard to reach all of our customers, but not just residential, but also our commercial and industrial customers. Um, and then we limited watering to one day per week based off even and odd addresses. Um, and that's 10 minutes per uh, irrigation station. And there are exceptions uh, that are associated uh, with hand watering uh, drip irrigation, but also for um, sport activity fields to maintain um, safety. Uh, there is no use of landscape irrigation after a rain uh, within 48 hours. The irrigation of new construction homes and buildings, uh, they all have to have um, water efficiency uh, devices. Uh, they need to have drip irrigation or microspray. Uh, and the use of potable water within uh, drinking fountains um, is prohibited unless those are recirculating. So we've done a um, aggressive outreach campaign uh, through social media, uh, but also trying to hit every opportunity to set up our conservation and outreach um, team, um, our, our program tents that we set out, uh, where we offer courses, we offer devices, 
um, and other educational uh, opportunities to be able to get um, uh, rebate programs. And I will turn it over to Mr. Flynn. There we go. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Um, Casitas um, in, uh, it lies primarily in Western Ventura County. Uh, it was a special district formed in 1952 by a vote of the people within the boundaries of the district. Um, supplies uh, not only water, but also recreational services at uh, Lake Casitas. Uh, population, overall population within the boundaries that are served are uh, about 64,000 people. And uh, that's split between uh, 46,000 folks in wholesale and 18,000 in retail. Um, the district did acquire one of its wholesale customers that was traditionally a wholesale customer uh, in, we call the Ojai Water System, which lies primarily within the city of Ojai in 2017. Our sources are purely local. Uh, I think you heard some of you remember Bennett talk about that. Uh, we're totally reliant on uh, local rainfall and runoff. Uh, and this shows our most recent uh, water supply mix. Uh, you can see surface water uh, dominates. One thing you want to take a look at, and I think others have noted that, uh, is those gray bars. Uh, that shows really the reduction in water demands that we've had through conservation uh, since our, our most local highest demand in uh, 2013. Uh, the uh, current forecast, we make a forecast every April or May on what we're looking like over the next five years or so uh, as far as lake supply and where our demands are at. And so moving from, from left to right, uh, currently lake level is right about 75,000 acre feet. Uh, and we're showing here that we have more than three years worth of water supply left in the lake right now. Uh, conservation actions that uh, the district has taken, we've had a long standing conservation program since 90, 1992, a conservation department that's dedicated to educating the public and but also helping customers. Uh, we do have uh, what we call our, our water efficiency and allocation program, uh, I think aptly named the WEEP. Uh, they, uh, every customer has an allocation that they're required to, to uh, comply with. Uh, and right now we've been in a stage three condition since 2016. Um, and that's a 30% mandatory reduction. Uh, and we also have in place a $5 per unit penalty for exceeding that, exceeding allocations. Uh, this shows where we are with our demands over time uh, in, our, in our classification mix. Probably the best thing or the most uh, useful thing to look at, let's see if I can do this, is this bar right here. This is what we're asking our customers to do, to conserve at that level right there. And you can see since 2016, they've been beating that handily. Uh, we're also looking at some local uh, supply projects uh, that we'll talk about in the second part of this program, as well as regional projects. So just a little quick preview of that um, before uh, the second part of the, project, of the program here. Now it's uh, Tony uh, from the Cayugas Municipal Water District. Can you hear me? Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Tony Goff. I'm the general manager with the Cayugas Municipal Water District. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Bennett and Senator Lamone for having us out tonight. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the uh, Cayugas Municipal Water District. So in the early 1900s, the southeastern portion of Ventura County uh, was predominantly ag. And uh, around the middle of the century, the wells started drying up and they started experiencing salty water, uh, water quality problems. And the communities in southeast Ventura County got together and they formed a collective to go out and find water. And that collective is the Cayugas Municipal Water District. We were formed in 1953 by a vote of the public. 
And uh, we were put in place to go out and search for new water supplies for southeastern Ventura County. Uh, there's a, the map of Ventura County right there, and you can see the shaded yellow area is Cayugas' service area. Uh, we are strictly a wholesaler. We don't have any retail connections, so don't have a connection to directly to the public. We sell water to 19 other water agencies. But we serve about 670,000 people uh, through our wholesale connections, uh, and we sell water to about... Um, about 75% of the um, Ventura County's population. Uh, we're governed by a five-member elected board, and we have about 70 employees at Cayugas. Uh, we are a state water, de state water project dependent agency. That's a term being thrown around now. It, it's a fairly new term, um, but with the reductions in the su supply on the state water project system, uh, and when you're dependent on that system, you get a new name. So uh, do, do we only get water from the State Water Project? No, not necessarily. We do get some amount of water from the Colorado River um, source as, as well. In fact, when Cayugas was formed, we were only getting Colorado River uh, supplies. We built our system, a pipeline 26 miles into the valley to reach out to Metropolitan System, and that's our wholesale provider. And uh, we were receiving uh, Colorado River supplies for the first you know, 10 years or so of our existence. 1972, we, we started bringing in state water project supplies into the county. Um, right now, uh, what's some of our, our, our historical challenges? Some of the historical challenges, we only have a single point of connection uh, to MET through a tunnel in the Santa Susana Mountains. Uh, and we only receive full service treated water from Metropolitan, which is an expensive source of water. So that's, those were some of our historical challenges. Um, that's actually a schematic showing Metropolitan's uh, service area down here. How do I do this? Okay, the white area uh, bounded in, in red is Met's service area. Metropolitan, when they were formed uh, for redundancy and reliability, they actually reached out to do different watersheds. They went north uh, to the Delta uh, and reached into the, the State Water Project system, and they went north uh, east to the Upper Colorado River system. So they. There's supposed to be reliability built into those two different watersheds, but what we're all seeing right now is all of the Western United States in severe drought, and both of those um, water supplies are vulnerable. Uh, Cayugas retailers, we sell water to six of the 10 cities in Ventura County and several large water agencies on the southeastern portion of Ventura County, and while Cayugas is 100% reliable on uh, reliant on imported water, our purveyors, our retail partners are not. They've uh, done their work, they've developed groundwater supplies, recycled water supplies, and uh, so the way it shapes up in, in our um, service area, we look at it sort of like the upper zone and the lower zone. Upper zone is basically the Canal Valley and Simi Valley, almost entirely re um, reliant on imported supplies, whereas you go down the Canal Grade, to the Oxnard Plain area where the groundwater resides, those folks down there have a mix of about 50-50 groundwater and imported water. Um, what we're experiencing right now is severe drought. Uh, we've had the three driest years in a row. January, February, and March were the three driest February, January, February, March in state history. And we received the, 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 the lowest amount of water in a three-year period than we've ever received from the state water project system. Um, so where are we now? We're uh, in April of this year, our board uh, enacted an emergency water conservation program. O Omar was re referring to that. Uh, what we're focusing on is outdoor water use. What we're really focusing on is lawns, one day a week watering. And what we're really, really focusing on is non-functional turf. The medians, the, the lawn in front of hotels, gas stations, and things like that. That's what we really want to get rid of. Uh, what we are prioritizing is trees, perennials. We want that urban canopy. We want the trees in place. We want to use the water that we have wisely. And uh, that's my time. There it is. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to come out and speak. Um, we 
hope that we could shed some light on how regionally uh, what we are doing is impacting this area, and especially Cayugas' territory. Have y'all found my slides? Oh, there you go. Thank you very much. All right. Moving ahead, this is Metropolitan's area. We are the nation's largest wholesaler of water. We started as a 13-member city, uh, and the state created us uh, specifically to bring Colorado River water into the area. And over time, we've grown, and we've now grown to 19 million people, servicing 5,200 square miles. Um, that covers six counties from Ventura all the way down to the Mexican border. And we support uh, one trillion regional economy. And again, our sources are the, uh, come from the State Water Project from Northern Sierra, that's 30%. 25% comes from the Colorado River water, and then our local supplies is 45%. This is a very busy slide, but what it shows you is that how stressed the State Water Project is right now in terms of their water and the Colorado River. Even though they have uh, plenty of uh, water available in the, in the northern area, when you look at Lake Mead and Lake, can't read it, Lake Powell, uh, it's a 28%. And what's in the middle is Metropolitan's um, D Diamond Valley Lake. And what I want to show you is that lake has a capacity of 800,000 acre feet. And when it gets down to 500,000 acre feet, we stop drawing from it because that's our six month emergency supply. And just to put it in terms, and I'm going to be using huge numbers, one acre foot of water is about 3,000. 226, you know, 326,000 acre feet. And that's enough to supply two households with water for an, in an average year. Now this just shows you what our current water uh, situation is. Our demand is normally about 1.6 uh, million acre feet, but this year it's a little bit more at 1.73. Um, 1.19 million acre feet is gonna be coming from the Colorado River State Water Project. That gives us the shortest of 400, excuse me, 546,000 acre feet that we're pulling from storage. And I'm gonna leave it right there and in my next presentation, I'll be talking about the solutions that we're, we're working on. Just good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Mauricio Gordado. I'm the general manager of United Water Conservation District. And uh, let's see, we go. So uh, we have a service area of about 334 square miles. We go from the Los Pad uh, Padres Forest all the way to the coast. And uh, our operation primarily consists of storing large quantities of water in our Lake Piru. Uh, we deliver and convey water to recharge groundwater basins. We provide surface flows to the ag community. And we don't have a direct connection to uh, meters for homes, but our operation is, and mission is to ensure that cities and municipalities have, uh, you know, we help them out in making sure that they have the water to provide the needs of their residents, as well as giving that resource to the farming community, make sure they have that resource to uh, essentially feed the nation. So we've been doing this for about 95 years now. So it's a, it's a longstanding operation that is I think served the county pretty well. Um, gonna give just a couple examples of some of the wells that we've taken in different parts of, of the county. These are in the upper basins, the, the east part of the Santa Clara River. What you could see there, you know, essentially the groundwater basins, the storage, you know, that we have underwater, uh, is, it, it's doing its job. And, uh, you know, although we see declines, we know these droughts are cyclic, we know we, you know, we don't have that crystal ball, it seems like they're getting longer. Um, but we haven't hit those historical lows yet. But that doesn't mean that we, we, we can't stop there. Doing nothing is not an option. So what does more look like? And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, here's another example of, of a well, more in this local area where we're meeting this evening. Uh, and again, you can see significant declines, uh, very consistent with Mr. Loeb's graphics of some of those groundwater wells. But again, we haven't hit that historic uh, level, low level yet. And it's because we, we have been doing some things. Um, current reservoir conditions in, in the state of California, obviously well below those historic averages. Um, our Lake Piru, which you, you see on the right-hand side there, we're, we're pretty low. We're at about 25% of its storage capacity. So, uh, you know, again, we're, we're ready to take on that, that, big, that big gulp, but uh, 
it's, uh, it's getting pretty low. Um, again, so what have we done to help those groundwater storage areas, those basins, uh, to, again, that, that we rely on during the drought, that we've relied on historically? Well, you can see here, since 2016, we've been working collaboratively with our partners here in, in, in Ventura County to bring additional water resources in. This has nothing to do with precipitation or state imported water other than where it comes from, you know, up north. And, you know, here working with our partners, we've been able to bring in new water sources of about 44, just over 44,000 acre feet. And as mentioned previously, um, that serves about 90,000 households for about a year. So we've been doing our job and uh, it's been helping out those groundwater levels. But, you know, we've got to do a lot more. And fortunately, working uh, collaboratively with, with folks here in Ventura County, oops, um, we've been able to uh, provide projects uh, inclusive into the groundwater sustainability plan that I'll get into a little bit better and show what the benefit of those groundwater sustainability projects uh, will do over time. Thank you. Uh, well, those panelists actually beat their time period and stuff, so really appreciate it, everybody. How, so how about a hand just for the first half of this thing? I, I know all of this is coming at you really uh, rapidly in terms of trying, trying to digest it. Uh, I want to point a couple of things out that, that I saw that I think are just big picture items. One, just in the last slides that uh, uh, Mauricio uh, showed us, you saw Fillmore up on the Santa Clara River up there recharging pretty well, but you saw the Oxnard well uh, much lower and dropping like the Fox Canyon uh, well showed from 2010 until now. We've had this sort of pretty steady and, and pretty serious decline in terms of groundwater. You've also seen as a result of that a greater and greater reliance on groundwater in Ventura County. So all of us, us uh, although groundwater is out of sight, all of us should really be paying attention to groundwater policies, who makes groundwater policy and, and what are we doing, um, because it is absolutely essential for us in, in terms of what we're doing from that standpoint. So far, we've heard from the three major wholesalers, uh, Mr. Pratt showed us up there, Jeff showed us, um, you know, we had uh, Casitas, we had United, uh, and we had Cayegas. And so we heard from those three major wholesalers and then Metropolitan with a relationship uh, with Cayegas there. Um, United, the, the one in the middle in the Santa Clara River, uh, primarily uh, focuses on uh, the two cities, uh, Oxnard, uh, but, but primarily it's agriculture, and so there's a lot of agricultural interest in, in the United one. Casitas um, has a strong agriculture side component to it, but much more of municipal and industrial. But look at the difference regionally. If you look at the uh, Casitas presentation, um, it's no state water connection at all, right? All just precipitation, what comes into the watershed is what they're using. And then if you look at the Eastern Ventura County, almost you saw 95% of the water for Thousand Oaks and Simi Valley comes from the state water project, almost completely dependent upon imported water. Um, and and uh, it's a, a fascinating combination for us to put together here in Ventura County uh, in terms of how we're going forward. So we're now moving to the second half of the presentation, um, and we're going to go back uh, to Janine Jones. Um, but this time, each of the presenters has basically two, two topics. We want them to use the first two minutes of their five minutes to talk about what water conservation and state resource programs they have for you, for the citizens out there, and then what are their long-term solutions that they have out there. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Janine, and uh, we really appreciate these guys uh, doing a great okay. job. Okay, um, thank you. And first of all, I hope that everyone picked up this handout on the table. This is a list of our DWR financial assistance programs that we have available now. And I would particularly like to call your attention to items number three and five in this brochure because those are our drought assistance grants. The small water system drought assistance grant is literally for systems that are literally running out of water or private wells that are dry. And then the larger um, uh, urban grants are for larger systems such as the ones represented here today and uh, would like to point out that these, uh, these funding sources came to us 
courtesy of the generosity of the legislature. And uh, this fiscal year, the larger urban program was augmented with some new funding for conservation programs, including turf replacement. But those, all of these grant programs here at the state level, these aren't grants to individual systems, these are grants to entities like water agencies, tribes, nonprofits, et cetera. So um, uh, those are the folks that would be applying for and getting these grants to use to benefit their service area. Uh, and I encourage you to talk to your water providers about uh, those grants, if, uh, uh, seeking those grants if you're interested. Uh, moving on to the long-term solutions. As I mentioned in the first round, you know, climate change. Uh, if we look at the state's large water systems that really form the backbone of our supply system, frankly, we've been living off of our grandparents' investment in infrastructure in many cases. And if we take the long view and look forward and think about end of century climate change protections, almost no snow left in the Sierra Nevada, much warmer temperatures, you know, we have a lot of work um, to do before us and it's going to require uh, making, as the assembly members said at the beginning of this evening, hard choices and doing the difficult things. You know, frankly, we've been doing the easy things. We've been doing the conservation programs, you know, sort of the cheap and easy, low-hanging fruit sorts of things. But we now have to step up and take those hard steps to encourage people to be willing to invest in what's needed to fix our system going forward. And one example I'd like to use is uh, San Diego. In the 1987 to 91 drought, San Diego woke up in 1991 and said, oh my God, we really have a problem. They only have 10% of their supplies are local. Everything else was imported and was really at risk. So they really bit the bullet over time and did amazing things in terms of securing long-term water transfers, emergency storage projects, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, their water rates really increased. Well, you know, that is what's going to be necessary. We have to recognize that. And by the way, one side benefit, so to speak, of increasing water rates is it definitely does encourage conservation. But, you know, we all have to follow the example of San Diego and be willing to take those uh, difficult choices. And, uh, you know, I would really like to point out that this is where, as the um, governor's recent uh, water strategy portfolio says, we need to do more of these big expensive projects, more recycling projects, and particularly with a focus on sigma implementation, there's a lot more interest in getting every available molecule of groundwater recharge. And that's going to take in many areas of the state a lot of infrastructure, a lot of the agencies doing their um, plans are really focusing on trying to find these sources. But the big bottom line message that I want to leave you with is that we need to be willing to step up and make those hard choices. I just, I just want, to, want to try to clarify for everybody as we're talking about both the, what kind of services they have for you and long-term solutions. Long-term solutions, recycling water is one of the major things that these various agencies are focusing on. Um, so it's, it's recycled water along with conservation, and then there are new sources of water that are out there. So we'll be anxious to hear about what your recycling plans are uh, as well as um, your conservation and long-term. Thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, I think it's important to understand the way the county works. Um, a lot of people think that we have this overarching water responsibility. We don't. We've got four water districts serving very specific areas. And we also have seven sewer districts with three treatment plants. And the treatment plants are important to the recycled water uh, discussion, which I'll get to. Um, but just so you understand, we've got Lake Sherwood, one of our water districts, 100% reliant on state water, Bell Canyon, 100% reliant on state water or imported water. And then we've got the Sea of Moore Park and surrounding areas, and that's Waterworks District 1. Um, we use about 20% groundwater, 80% um, imported. And then the community of Somis and its surrounds, um, that uses about 80% groundwater and 20% imported water. Um, I do not. Um, that was just a, in, the intro for that slide. But um, the uh, water, so what are we doing as far as um, 
um, our outreach, our, our water conservation resources. Well, we largely recycle what the state does, Metropolitan does, and Cayugas does. They provide us with a lot of materials because we're highly dependent on them. We also attend many community outreach meetings, whether or not um, they are um, served by our water districts. We get a lot of unincorporated areas that have small purveyors that need outreach materials. So we attend those meetings, hand out uh, the materials that we have um, because they apply uh, basically to uh, everyone. Um, we also uh, put all of those outreach materials on our website, on social media, and, and billing inserts we send to our customers. As far as our conservation efforts are concerned, you know, the biggest thing we've done recently is the automated meter infrastructure. That is, um, we've got meters that do real time on all of our um, uh, service connections. So what does that mean? Well, we got real-time leak detection. If we see something going off, we'll get a bell and whistle. The software that runs it, get a bell and whistle, say, hey, you need to look at this. It also gives real-time usage to customers. They could get on and look to see how they're using water and what they can do to decrease it. Uh, we've done a ton of water efficient fix fixtures through um, rebates that are offered through Metropolitan and Cayugas. There have been turf rebates um, and we've, expanded all of our recycled water use. So at our three treatment plants, um, well, two of our treatment plants, we had zero discharge to stream. We either get it all recycled, reuse it for ag, golf courses, parks, or we put it in groundwater recharge. And we can do that because we have perk basins that um, as a result of using all of that water um, are no longer needed. So we can recharge to those perk basins. We have, um, reduced per capita usage by 45% over the last 10 years. Uh, further long-term solutions we're looking towards are side channel stormwater diversion and recharge using those same perk basins um, because they are dry now. Um, and so we can divert some storm flows off of, in this case, Cayugas Creek and potentially even in Santa Clara River, put them in the perk basins, recharge the groundwater aquifers. Um, we're looking at urban water diversion to the plant for recycled water use. Um, in other words, letting um, uh, the urban discharger picks up some of their stormwater and treat it um, uh, through the sewer. And then we are able then to use it for recycled water. And then the biggest one, we're looking at a brackish water desal. Brackish water is highly salty water that's underground, uh, underlying basins. Um, that may have become salty by upstream discharges and, and the perking into the basin, but it requires the removal of the salts, the minerals. Um, it's not nearly as expensive as ocean desal. Um, it's an order of magnitude, well, almost an order of magnitude less. Uh, there's a big, we've got a site, we've got a feasibility plan, and um, we're discussing partnerships at this time uh, near the area of uh, City of Moore Park. And that is my side of it. We um, will now go back to full round uh, with the um, with the cities, um, starting with Gina. Uh, I want to put a point out a couple of things, and we may get the cities to address some of these things. Number one, there's I don't think there's any question people have to brace themselves for the fact that water is going to cost more and more. It's going to become more and more precious, and it's just going to cost more and more. Do these infrastructure projects, et cetera, to recycle? Well, recycling, almost everybody uh, supports it, but it's expensive to do recycling. So we just have to recognize that. I think you have to find ways to subsidize the lowest income people so that they're not uh, disadvantaged, and the rest of us are simply going to have to um, uh, pay more for water. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that recycled water water. Um, it, it sounds really good. Everybody likes it until you hear about toilet to tap. And then all of a sudden, emotionally, everybody uh, can't handle that. So they've now changed that phrase, by the way, showers to flowers, which uh, <laughs> is, uh, sounds much better, right? Um, but uh, we do have to recognize, I mean, in Israel, they have, you know, they've addressed this, but right now, almost all the recycling uh, that we do, we take, we recycle the water, we put it back into the ground, and then we pump it back out. And psychologically, that works for everybody much better, but it is more expensive to do 
view it that way. And you, you have to recognize that there's there's more waste and everything else uh, when you do that. So, um, we, we, you know, basically you're taking your, your sewage plant and you're tying it back into your, your system. Um, and in other places in the world where water has been really precious for a long time, uh, that's really an issue. Final thing I, I just want to mention uh, right now, and that is that the explosion in groundwater pumping in the state of California started in the 1990s. And we are now just catching up with how, how significant that is. Just since Sigma passed, that's that groundwater law in 2014, in the overdrafted basins in the Central Valley, in the San Joaquin Valley, 6,000 new wells have been sunk into the overdrafted basin since 2014. Meanwhile, just last year alone, a thousand, just last year alone, a thousand domestic wells went dry in that same area where the 6,000 new wells went in, and those are almost all low-income farm worker communities uh, that are really suffering uh, as a result of that. So uh, there, there's really a serious problem statewide, um, and it is certainly trickling into to our area here. So uh, with that, Gina, we're going to go to you and uh, water conservation and longer-term solutions, and City of Ventura has some exciting things uh, going on with them in terms of recycling and their longer-term solutions. Jean. All right, thank you very much. And thank you, Jeff, for mentioning the AMI um, infrastructure. The city has um, nearly Im implemented its entire program with AMI, and I think that's why we are seeing such a, a dramatic effect with conservation. People can now keep an eye on their water usage at their home. Um, we do have a robust um, suite of, pro of uh, rebate programs and incentives for the uh, city of Ventura and our customers. Uh, we have a turf removal program. We have a uh, water survey that we can come out to the home and look around, to do leak detection and conservation efforts, um, let them know how to uh, conserve around the home. Um, one of our most exciting uh, incentive programs is our recycled water mobile reuse program. It is a program where for a small fee and some training, customers can come down to our wastewater recycling facility, pick up recycled water and take home for irrigating their landscape. Um, and we served over 1.6 million dollars, or 1.6 million gallons of water um, during uh, last year. And I can't seem to advance the slides, but we'll just keep rolling for time's sake. Um, one of the bigger long-term projects that we have going on is the state water interconnection um, with uh, a pipeline to Camarillo to connect with Cayegas' system to bring in the state water allocation for Ventura that um, we have paid in for since the 1970s. Uh, this is a project that's now in the permitting and design phase. It is a... Um, a uh, project that we're working out regional agreements with um, Gallegas, United Water, and Casitas, and um, we're hoping to have start construction in 2024. The important thing to note about the state water interconnection and the water that it will bring in is that it's replacement water supply, um, really to um, help augment um, a, a loss of the current supplies that we have. The other exciting uh, project that we have, um, <laughs> I can't seem to bring up here, but yeah, there we go. Um, is our Ventura Water Pure Program, and that is our potable reuse program. And uh, this is bringing in a new water supply to the city of Ventura. It is a drought-resistant, rain-independent water supply um, that not only will bring in a high-quality uh, water, it will answer the environmental and legal challenges on our wastewater effluent discharge to the Santa Clara River estuary. These are the components of the Ventura Water Pier Program. Uh, we will take the recycled water from the uh, water, uh, wastewater treatment plant that treats the city's wastewater flows and send it to an advanced purification facility to be treated to a quality of water that exceeds drinking water standards. That will be injected into a groundwater basin and then pumped out at a later time to serve as water supply for our customers. One of the critical components of uh, this advanced purification process is an ocean outfall to dispose of the um, concentrate minerals removed during the purification process. So when we look at how we are bringing in these water supplies and um, looking at our um, current projections going back to our urban water management plan, um, this demonstrates the fact that we are actually going to continue to um, uh, be able to meet our dry um, drought conditions um, in the near future and in the long term by bringing on these new water supplies. 
An important um, part of this is how do we ensure that we can continue to develop and grow within the city, as well as ensure that our uh, water supply is um, and the resiliency is protected. We have our net zero policy that was adopted in 2016. This requires a new development to bring in a new offset of water, either through water rights dedication, extraordinary conversation, conservation, um, or a combination with a, a net zero fee. And this fee collected helps to fund that new water supply from the Ventura Water Peer Program. Um, so we make sure that there is a um, cost sharing for the Ventura Water Peer Program between our new, or between our existing customers and our future customers. Um, this is sort of a breakdown of, of that cost sharing. Um, existing customers pay through rates and future customers will pay through that net zero fee. And I'll hand it to Omar once again. Thank you. So um, Oxnard has developed our website, oxnardwater.org, where our customers can go to uh, look at uh, opportunities for rebates for turf removals, but also um, download some helpful tips on conservation, but also irrigation tips. Uh, we've also developed a water hotline where customers can also call and request for us to mail them um, information regarding um, conservation efforts, uh, but it also gives them a platform to report any water waste. Uh, that, since uh, we started out, we seem to get a lot of calls uh, on that line. So staff, staff is very busy. So long-term solutions, overarching themes. Um, I know all of our colleagues um, our legislators, we know that we all need to coordinate together. Um, you know, we, we all have similar um, needs and uh, issues along with our water resources and how we're going to approach the future. Part of that is, you know, we, we want to look at the use of conjunctive use. How do we go about uh, coordinating use of uh, various resources and the right time to do them, you know, such as, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, during the warmer time or drought. You know, do we utilize that groundwater and relieve that pressure off of the state water and utilize that state water when it's more readily available or use, utilize recycled water that's been banked um, in your aquifers? So everybody's issue is what? We don't have a water problem, we have a money problem. So everybody looks at funding and then we have to look at how do we go about building out these facilities? Well, Oxnard already has an advanced water purification facility that's already been built out. Um, and that water takes the discharge from the wastewater plant and treats it into an ultra pure um, uh, water that currently we uh, move to our um, agricultural customers. So we have developed an aquifer storage and recovery well. We expect that construction to be completed um, uh, next year. And that's going to allow us to take that ultra pure water and put it into the ground, uh, hold it for a resident time, and utilize it to demonstrate to the state that it meets uh, drinking water sources. So our council has already approved the expansion of our advanced water purification facility. Um, and we've obtained a WAFIA loan uh, for part of that uh, construction. Uh, we know that we need to work collaboratively with um, our state officials uh, to see you know, how do we utilize this funding that is out there, um, especially when we know that there's a large amount of water funding uh, or funding for water infrastructure. Uh, and we'll also be looking at, to work with Metropolitan to obtain um, any funding as well. So we know that we are looking to develop uh, some sort of rate structures um, that incentivize uh, the purchasing of state water in wet years. You know, Oxnard looks forward to partnering with Cayagas and Metropolitan Water. Um, you know, the objective is, you know, overbuying that state water in wet years, storing it in the groundwater basin. Uh, we can pump that water out later along with any aquifer storage uh, that we've put in the ground uh, through our recycled water. And this uh, obviously would also require a partnership uh, with Fox County and Groundwater Management Agency to allow some sort of banking uh, of those resources for multiple years. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, you saw this last time, and uh, but you can see the, the, the demand response that we had at Casitas in the early part of this. 
uh, this drought. And essentially, we've been in a drought now, uh, really had just one good rain year since 2012. So we've been in about 10 years. Um, realized that our customers um, understood that where their water comes from. And so we needed to help them to, to not only uh, reinforce those messages of, of cons conservation, but also to comply with, uh, with our WEEP and figuring out how to, to make their allocations work. So first part of that is educating, of course, and we do have uh, an extensive web page that talks about, uh, we call it Your Water, that talks about uh, conservation and uh, but also talks about what we're doing as far as uh, bolstering our supply, and we'll get to that in a minute here. We've had a, con a con conservation department's been very active over the last 10 years uh, in uh, pointing people to waterwise gardening uh, resources, uh, not only here in the county but uh, in the state as well. Uh, water re you know, rebates on appliances and controllers, um, and then we also go out and we'll do no-cost landscaping surveys. And people do take advantage of that, usually after they get a large penalty. That's usually when, we, when they want to talk to us. Um, and we realize you know, that our bills are really a, a great way to communicate. We do put, put bill messages in, but we also put those large penalties in there uh, when people go over their allocations. So we give them assistance in working toward uh, complying with allocations. Um, and it really has you know, paid a big benefit uh, for, for Casitas and its water supply. Uh, we're working on not only, like I mentioned before, we're working not only on uh, local water supply projects, but also uh, regional projects. So I'll, I'll cover those here real quickly. Um, first one is a seven mile pipeline uh, that has been a collaborative effort between four of the panelists' uh, agencies up here uh, and uh, moving water essentially from uh, Camarillo into Ventura system. And that would allow access uh, for the, the entities to get state water project water, such as Ventura and, uh, and Casitas. And second project, this is to the north. This would bring water in from Santa Barbara County, um, basically connecting those two systems. There's about a 1.3 mile uh, gap between the two systems, um, and this would, would fill that gap. It also would require some other facilities to move the water all the way back into the system, uh, including a couple of pump stations. Um, capital cost is looking to be about 18 to 20 million, uh, and we, we do have funding, uh, a certain amount of funding for that, um, for that project already, already in place. Um, we expect to get going on that pipeline construction here uh, sometime in the next 18 months or so. And that's all I have. There we go. Yeah, okay, so what are we facing now? We're facing changing hydrology. Uh, climate change is here. Um, where water sources are being squeezed everywhere. Uh, right now, in fact, uh, our June water deliveries were the same as they were in 1977. It was about half the population that we serve uh, now back in 1977. So we're having this weather whiplash. I talked about the driest January, February, and March in state history. It was also the snowiest December in state history. We've got a weather whiplash. Uh, Mike Flood is the one who told me that the state water project used to be about consistency, now it's about opportunity. Uh, we have old infrastructure. A friend of mine from Mork says, likes to say, our infrastructure is so 20th century. Uh, we have infrastructure that does not match our hydrology any longer. Um, so, let me see here. Let me get my notes. <clears throat> so, uh, a, a colleague from mine here in attendance, uh, of mine here in attendance, likes to say, we've done everything that we can do that's easy. We've done everything that we can do alone. We've done everything that we can do that's cheap. Now we need to work together. And this slide says we need to develop new sources of water. We need to better manage and reuse, uh, re uh, reuse and conserve the water we have. I would go further than that and say we need to begin to collaborate, uh, not just within our industry. The, all the folks up here on this panel have been talking. We're passionate about this. We talk constantly. Uh, we need to work together. We need to work within our industry. We need to work outside of our industry. We need to build a bridge 
uh, between that gap between the industry and environmental community. Uh, there's a lot of work we need to do. Um, so rebate opportunities, Cayugas partners with Metropolitan Water District. Jackie's probably going to touch on some of this stuff. Uh, BeWaterWise.com is the main uh, 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 website for opportunities. We offer rebates for um, efficient appliances, uh, leak detection devices, rain barrels, things like that. We also uh, offer $3 per square foot uh, for a turf replacement. Uh, our board authorized us to spend a million dollars on that earlier this year. Uh, that went quickly. Uh, last, uh, last night, our board, uh, at the most recent board meeting, authorized another million dollars for a total of two million for this drought. Uh, so go to BeWaterWise.com if you live within the Cayugas service area and uh, apply to remove any turf that uh, you want to get rid of for $3 per square foot uh, if, you, if you meet the criteria of, of the program. Um, uh, infrastructure projects that we're doing uh, within our service area, we're building uh, interconnections with other wa water agencies. We've completed an a, a, a interconnection with Crestview Mutual Water District. Uh, they're in the Camarillo Heights, uh, uh, Camarillo Estates area. Uh, outside of our service area, but within our county, we're working with our partners in Casitas and City of Ventura United. Uh, for the interconnection project that uh, Mike described. And then uh, bridging another uh, gap between the LA County line is an inter uh, interconnection project we're doing with the Los Virginis Municipal Water District. Um, that's under underway right now, thank you. Um, in 2017, we took a look at D-Cell. Uh, it was the first time we ever uh, had to uh, use the billion dollar term in any project that um, we were looking at. Uh, it was not a project that we were analyzing. We were looking at rough costs at that time. Uh, that led us to look at uh, what are the other water supplies out there before we go to desal. That's uh, one of the criteria of, of entertaining the thought of desal is, have you done everything else you can do? Uh, so it led to a water supply alternative study. Uh, we analyzed over 100 different water supplies uh, uh, and we just completed that study earlier this year, uh, and our board has been, begun a strategic uh, planning process. And one of the things that has become clear through that process is we need more collaboration. We need to work close, more closely with our, our partners in the water community. And um, so I think that's what you're gonna see more of from Cayugas and, and most of us up here is this regional collaboration working together on projects. All right, uh, Tony just told you how this historic drought is the worst we've ever seen, and that's because we've never had um, no rain in January, February, and March. It caught us off guard, uh, but the areas that are impacted the most are these six member agencies you see here. Now, the ones on the east side can get water from the Colorado River or local supplies, but as you've heard, Cayegas is 100% dependent on the state water project, and when we got those cutbacks, they were hurt and hit pretty hard. So what our engineers did is said, hey, we've got to fix this problem. Let's sit down and see what we can do now, and then let's see what kind of projects we can get going forward in the near, near term and in the long term. They came up with 100 different projects, and they put a timeline on it. We won't be able to start building until 2000 2023 because we're still in the design phase. But what we were able to do is to talk to our other state water project users and say, hey, use less so we can ship that water over to Cayegas. And then also we went up north and did some exchanges and took some state water project there and they were taking water out of their groundwater basins. And we've also pulling some more out of storage and then also, again, changing some of our operations. So here's what it looks like in the near term. We're going to be putting in some pumping stations in, up in the northern part at Greg Avenue, Sepulveda and Venice, and then also an inner tie at Burbank. On the long term ones, we're going to be beefing up some of those areas and then also putting in uh, let's see here very quickly, some new storage over in the west side and also banking some water up in the Antelope Valley. They have a groundwater basin up there that can store up to one million acre feet, which is great news. Our water, uh, we asked our member agencies to start conserving. Uh, the other agencies on the east side are pretty much hitting their target. Again, because Cayegas and Los Virginis are 100% dependent, it's a little more difficult for them. So it's a heavier lift, but they are making strides which we're kind of proud of. And I want to talk about uh, this water recycling uh, program we've got going. It's called Pure Water of Southern California. 
We're partnering with the Los Angeles County Sand District down in Carson, and we're gonna be building this system. It's gonna be the largest recycling system in the United States. And when it's completed, we will be able to produce 150 million gallons a day, and that's enough for 500, excuse me, half a million homes. So that water will then be freed up from the Colorado River again that we can move over to the west side. The cost to build is 3.4 billion, 129 million to operate. And you compare that to the cost of Metropolitan's water, and Tony says it's very expensive. It's about $1,100 uh, uh, an acre foot. This program's about 1,800, but again, it brings in a good amount of water. Uh, the environmental process is ongoing uh, from 2021 to 24, and it will take eight years to complete. The good news we just got from the state is we've got eight, $80 million that we can now put toward that program. Going back to the state water project, and I remember I told you we are 30% dependent on it, but it also serves 27 million uh, Californians and farmland. And what I want you to really see is that a lot of people have the perception that Metropolitan pulls a lot of water out of that system. So we get a lot of uh, pushback from the Northern California. But of the 17% that you see that's exported, and we only take 4%. What we wanna do, let me go back up there. Well, half of it goes right now under the ocean when we have an average year. What, this, what we wanna do is complete the project. This is our current system, but we wanna put, well, it's actually susceptible to earthquakes because we've got uh, faults up there. We've got the, the levee systems that are subsiding and sub subject to liquefaction. And what we're doing now is we just came up with a new system. We did have an ERR in 2013 that was approved for a two tunnel system. Newsom came in in 2019 and said, no, you can only get one tunnel. So it set us back 10 years, but what it allows us to do is to make sure that water continues to flow and that when fish come by our pumps, we don't have to shut them down. And if there is an earthquake, it's protected and the water can still continue to flow. And that's a $16 billion project. Uh, probably it will increase our average homeowner's uh, bill, maybe about $3 to $5 a month. It depends on where you are in the system. And we will start building that hopefully in 2024. Again, um, it was mentioned about Newsom's water strategy. He just came out with this in August 11th. He wants to create 4 million acre feet of new storage. He wants to recycle and reuse 80,000 acre feet by the year 2030. And he wants to free up 500,000 acre feet through conservation. And then also, again, you heard talk about stormwater capture and desal. That's, excuse me, that's part of his program. And with that, yes, please go to our bewaterwise.com. Even though you're not in our service area, some of you may not be, there's still some good helpful tips there to tell you what you can do for turf removal and what type of plants you can put in, how you can fix leaks. And so we're continuing to ask people to please do what you can to conserve. Because again, those projects that we talked about aren't being starting start to be built through 2023 through 2024. Thank you. We'll start my time yet. <laughs> I'm glad everyone's hanging on. I, I think I'm at the tail. I'm at the tail end here, so I uh, really appreciate your time on this one. Um, so you've you've seen the governor's you know plan you know that's been shown a couple of times, uh, adapting to you know hotter, drier future. And I've included some excerpts here because um, you know it talks about what the governor wants to do, uh, what people should do. Um, you know, obviously taking opportunities of desal, creating storage capacity, uh, conservation, maximizing recycled water, uh, extending brackish water treatment type uh, solutions, and uh, capturing storm water. Well, interestingly enough, as this comes out, um, the next slide is going to show you is that we're not starting from zero. For the last three, four years, we've been in implementation mode. Uh, ironically enough, every single one of these projects are, are currently underway, currently being developed. We are in implementation mode, and they align directly with the governor's water supply plan. So we've talked already about uh, more of the, of the state water. Uh, that's been very effective. We've taken the opportunity when it's presented itself, brought in the water, either stored it or conveyed it and recharged it. And you can see all of the benefits associated with that state water. And what these projects do is, you've heard uh, Mr. Kim Loeb talk about this gap, a gap between 
the sustainable yield and what's extracted. And that's about, you know, 38,000 acre feet. Well, these projects on the low end combined exceed that. This is what sustainability looks like. And uh, when we talk about the Freeman expansion, we talk about climate change, uh, predictably, you know, with more flashing circumstances, more runoff, uh, more episodic uh, uh, flows in the river, we want to be able to capture that water, that, you know, high, you know, you know so sedimentation type water and put it to more beneficial use. Well, that Freeman expansion project does that, diverting a little bit more uh, and uh, sending it to recharge back into the ground. And the, the groundwater basins at the Freeman diversion in El Rio, you know, by engineering standard, if you get two to three feet of a percolation rate, you're high-fiving one another. Those basins are champions. They get anywhere between 12 and 14 feet per day of percolation rate. So when we get water there, good things happen. Uh, the coastal, uh, coastal brackish water treatment plant, that's a great partnership that we've now put together with uh, the United States Navy. Uh, we have a letter of agreement with the Navy. Uh, uh, um, we're, we're all in, we've been working very collaboratively to make that happen. That's gonna bring uh, a really sustainable source, not only taking water from the ocean and treating that to not only a potable use, but also uh, irrigation purposes. But that seawater intrusion plume, we've talked about that. We've had a problem out here in Ventura County for almost a century with, uh, with this seawater intrusion issue. This project, working with the Navy, will now solve that solution, bring that water back in, create more of a freshwater plume, and have a sustainable source of supply 24-7, 365. And the recycled water, working with the local agencies here to, to make sure that that's conveyed and delivered. And then optimizing pumping around the region. Again, all of these have identified in the groundwater sustainability plan that the Fox Canyon GMA has now filed with the state. Again, in implementation mode, already being developed. And as you can see by that schedule, we're not 10, 15, 20 years out. We're way ahead of schedule that Sigma has allowed and we'll have these facilities online uh, in, in very, very short order, but we can't do it alone. We know we can't do it alone, and that's where, uh, you know, from the get-go, about three years ago, we had a water sustainability summit. Uh, it was you know, uh, just this collaborative, regional approach effort where we had legislators attend. Uh, we had the privilege of our Senator uh, Monique Lamone attend on one of those panels. We bring in uh, regulators, stakeholders, water professionals, and at that time, three, three and a half years ago, we developed a plan, not just talk, not just concepts, but action oriented. And as a result of that first summit is the projects that were developed that I just showed you that bring us drought resiliency here in Ventura County. We're having our third one come October. Uh, we're excited to show the progress of those projects. And again, bringing people together regionally to develop new ideas so that we can, again, just keep compounding on the success towards that sustainability type environment that we, uh, that we need here in Ventura County. So I encourage you to join us. And again, uh, you know, we're, we're excited about what the future looks here because again, we are in implementation mode. Wow. If you guys turn around and look at the clock, remember I said 7.31? And look at that, 7.32. You're terrible, you guys. You're a minute, <laughs> a minute over, right? Um, well, wow. just incredible. I, I, I really do want, before we get into the questions and answers, and maybe some of you drift away, how about a big round of applause for this? <laughs> just, I, I, I really am impressed with how much they were able to digest uh, all of that information. So we have a number of questions that have been submitted. Uh, what I think is the best thing for us to do right now is I'm gonna, going to identify a bunch of the questions, even though they may not all get answered, just so people sort of know that those questions were asked. And some of them are specific to particular cities and stuff, and the city may want to um, post those, because if, you, if, if we're inviting the cities and anybody else to respond to any of these questions tonight, and we will put these questions and the responses on my website. Um, and so a few things I, I want to say. Number one, 
if you want to make sure that you know about our next meeting, make sure that you have submitted your email to, uh, to us so that my staff has that. So everybody that responded, we have your email. So if you've responded already, you don't have to do anything. But if you're, if you've somehow got on and you're watching or you, you want to make sure some other people, because we probably won't have the resources to send out a big mailer every time we decide to have one of these kinds of things and we'll do it by email. So one, make, make sure that that happens. Um, and two, then we will post all of the information. So my website will have sort of a water forum digest where there'll be a link to this if people want to watch it uh, uh, anytime when there'll be these questions and answers and as many of the PowerPoints as people are willing to let us have, we'll have links to those also um, as we go forward. So I hope that we'll be willing to, to do that um, and, and help. Um, this is, it's certainly uh, a tough situation for California, a tough situation for us now, but there's some hope here uh, that you hear that people are trying to come up with some uh, rational solutions as we go forward. Um, I want to mention a few of these things that, again, try to wrap the big picture. Um, some people may ask, why is the city of Ventura uh, trying to connect to the state water project when the state water project looks like it's not going to have the ability to give, you know, give, give, re give water to even the people that, you know, sort of have been out there already getting the water. And Tony said something, and, and that something has changed. It used to be you counted on the state water project as your water supply. But now what people are doing is they're saying we need water resiliency. Water resiliency means you have multiple sources of water and you hope that one of them is on uh, while the others are off. And we actually had that situation in the state a few years ago. We were sitting here with not much water in Ventura County, but they had enormous amounts of rain up north and enormous snow. And suddenly the state water project was saying, hey, anybody want to buy water from us, right? Well, if you weren't hooked up to the state water project, you couldn't take it take advantage of that one-time opportunity to maybe recharge your aquifer, your, your, your basin, et cetera. So that's my understanding. I hope I spoke right for Gina. That, that's my understanding of why the city of Ventura might be doing that. But resiliency is going to be one of the names of the games in terms of solution. And resiliency means linking more of the systems together so that one system maybe is doing well. That's what's happened with, you, with, uh, with Metropolitan. Metropolitan said, we're going to take more water from the Colorado River so that you other people in the state can take more water, can have our water from the state water project because we have two possible sources. Again, collaboration, those kind of things happen when we move into this sort of more thoughtful approach rather than the old-fashioned competition and, and everybody just out there uh, fighting for it. Um, there are two things that, uh, a few other things that I want to point out so that when we come up to 8 o'clock, at least we've identified all the challenging uh, things out there. Um, uh, Mauricio talked about you know taking more flows from the Santa Clara River up in uh, the Ojai Valley. Uh, we were trying to take some high flows off of the off of the San Antonio Creek to recharge uh, water basins. But you have uh, regulations uh, that deal with how much of the flow can you take, and are you taking more flow and then uh, making it uh, ruining the natural environment of the river? Uh, you talk about ruining the natural environment. Uh, uh, was it wasn't it shocking looking at Tony's picture? Pictures of that was Lake Oroville you had right. So how full Lake Oroville was, and here you were, just three years later, uh, three years later, and you saw it was just just like a trickle. Well, the the, reg, the state regulators that deal with fish and wildlife, etc., uh, say you know we shouldn't just turn all of our streams into just sort of these these dry uh, riverbeds, and so they are charged with the responsibility of trying to figure out how much water can United take off Santa Clara River and not cause a problem? How much water can uh, you know we take uh, the county of Ventura for, off the San Antonio Creek and not cause a problem? Those are tricky conversations about how much can you take, um, and those are, are some of the water regulations that United will have to uh, be dealing with uh, as we move forward. Uh, I would offer Australia as a head of us in terms of moving forward. They had a 12-year drought and then two years of fires after that, and they nationalized water. They said all of these water districts and all of that other stuff, it's not working. And they, they, they became very serious about water, and you know, it, we may get to that point, but as, as Jeff Pratt talked about, we have over 150 water districts in Ventura County alone. That's a, a, that's a lot to try to coordinate uh, as you move forward. Um, 
the um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not advocating that we have federal, you know, national. I'm just telling you what how, how dramatic it got in 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 Australia at the time. But when they did do that nationalization, you know, what they put as the first priority was domestic use, right? And that's you know making sure you have drinking water and water for your hospitals and that's the cities and stuff. The second was making sure that the stream stream stayed natural. Then the third was agriculture. It was was interesting. I'm just pointed that out as, as that as an example. Um, Tony, I mean, uh, Mauricio talked about uh, taking the plume. You know, you saw on that map that Jeff had that showed the salt water in, intruding in underground. Well, that's, that, that, that's, that's a negative uh, for us because that can start to pollute all this fresh water. Although, from the Coastal Commission standpoint, they would rather you take your desalinization water, you, know, you take your intake from that rather than from the ocean because you don't have the fish larvae in the ocean and you don't have those impacts. The question, the challenge for United is, how do you take that water and not invite more saltwater intrusion? And United believes they can solve that problem, but they will have to prove that they cannot, you know, because it doesn't make any sense to cr have created the Fox Canyon groundwater thing to stop saltwater intrusion and then say, well, we're gonna actually take the saltwater and, and create more of that. That's, those are all tricky things, but there are answers out there is the point, but they are going to cost money. They're gonna take collaboration. They're gonna ta have to take practical common sense. I love the line that the uh, star came up with. You know, we all have to be pragmatic environmentalist, uh, perhaps, uh, in terms of trying, trying to deal with that. Um, and the other thing I would offer to you is that the state groundwater agencies are, um, uh, really have to pick up the pace in terms of what they're doing uh, for everybody in the state. Because uh, if they suffer, you can bet there will be less state water available, there will be less uh, uh, resiliency, and we'll be more and more on our own. And if we do become more and more on our own, we do have to really work together, come up with solutions, and try to make this happen. So with that, I'm going to race through a bunch of questions, and then I'm going to well, I'm going to announce right now the two biggest questions that we're getting repeated over and over again. One, what about desal? Why, you know, is the city going to build desal? The city of Ventura going to build desal? Who's going to do desal, et cetera? So you've heard some references to that, but a lot of people want to know what's going on with desal. So I'll invite people to try to answer that. The second one that I think most of the panelists don't want to answer, don't want to, don't want to answer, right, uh, is. Uh, why are we building more housing if we have this water crisis, right? So, good. So, so that, that is, so, so that, is, that is one that I'm going to try to give you what the rationale is. I'm not trying to tell you this is, that I believe all of this stuff, but I want to tell you what the answers are that are, are out there sort of in the state world only because, I mean, the easiest thing for me to do politically would be to duck that and say, why don't one of you guys answer that question, right? Uh, I'm not approving housing. I'm a state legislator, you know, but, but there are no elected officials up here. So it's not fair to put staff on the line in terms of doing that. So I'm going to do it and tell you all the things I've heard. Whether I buy them all or not is different, but I do think it's important. If we want to have an intelligent conversation, uh, we need to be able to get that information out there also. So I'm going to, I'm going to, so I, I will start with that one. Um, and that, because that is the hardest one. That's the elephant in the room in terms of what everybody wants to talk about. So, uh, I come, I, I did the SOAR initiatives in Ventura County, so most people don't associate me with a sort of pro-growth camp uh, at, at all. Um, my belief has always been you want to try to protect those, the, the open spaces, the agriculture, uh, the green spaces uh, in Ventura County, then you have to take more density in the existing cities where we live. It, we talked about that all the way back when we did the first SOAR initiative in 1995, and people just sort of like got dreamy-eyed when we talked about more density. But if you look at what's happening in cities now, cities are getting more focused. For Thousand Oaks increased density in downtown Thousand Oaks, which was unheard of five years ago, uh, that they would approve a project like that. Certainly Ventura has a whole lot of uh, housing that's going on. It concerns a lot of people. Uh, but that is, that is sort of the evolution of protecting your open spaces outside. You get more density inside. But you saw over and over again, this is the first response. So I'll give you the first response given by those people that have been approving housing. And that is, 
you saw in a number of these presentations that while the population has grown, the demand for water has not grown with it. You can increase population if you do more uh, conservation and those kinds of things. And interest, the second thing that they point out is that an acre of agricultural land uses more water than that acre developed with housing. So the, 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 the fundamental argument that you, know, you can't take this acre out of agriculture because you, uh, and put it into housing because you don't have the water for that, uh, that, that doesn't actually, that, that's what they offer as, as, a, as a second big reason. A third reason that they offer is, uh, and again, not everybody's gonna, gonna buy this, but I wanna be responsible today and, and present their, their, their presentation. A, a third reason they say is that housing is a fundamental issue that we have a crisis in. My own view is we don't need more market rate housing. We need more affordable housing, right, for, for the workforce. But that, that being said, that's not necessarily what, what's always getting built. But that's what we really need. But if I had to choose and say, if somebody came along and said, we can build, you know, a thousand really cool, very low cost affordable housings and we can get people in your community right now into housing, right? and somebody said, well, we don't have the water for that, I would sure bend over backwards to try to find some way. And the city of Ventura offered tonight an explanation. The city of Ventura said, if you want to build new housing, you have to come up with the water to replace that, right? Now, you might think that some people would say, well, paying into a fund isn't actually coming up with the new water, but all of these projects are going to be very expensive, and so, paying into the fund or identifying new water. It used to be a while ago, developers would go to a school, like schools that I taught at at Nordoff High School, and they'd come in and say, we're gonna replace all of the toilets in your school because that will save enough water that I can build my 15 houses over here, right? So there are things that people are doing, um, but that's the best that I can do to try to answer the question that was asked most often about this. And I, I, I really wanna to get to these other questions. I know we could get in this dialogue, so let me, let me see if we have time, and I, I wanna to come to that uh, real quick. Quickly. Um, the, the other one is desal, and um, if would anybody, but I'm going to turn to Gina because I know what the answer is from the city of Ventura, and I want to make sure it gets out there. Where is desal on the list in terms of long term solutions for the city of Ventura? I'm going to ask Omar also, uh, then I'm going to come back to, to Tony uh, with that and stuff because they all three have some conversations about desalinization. Go ahead, Gina. Okay, so you heard um, our other agencies talk about desal being a very costly project. And um, the fact that they're gonna ask us, what have you done to get to desal? Desal sort of your last um, project. Um, and we have gone through water recycling. So that Ventura Water Peer Program is our first step in addressing our water supply issues. In fact, it was our environmental impact report based on water supply. It is in the phase two of that environmental impact report that we explore desal at a programmatic level. So we are looking at meeting our projected demands with the Ventura Water Peer Program. And if that is um, not feasible in the future, then desal becomes a feasible project. Great, Omar? Yeah, one, one minute, 90 seconds, that kind of time frame. Perfect, take your time. Yeah, I think we're all going to hear the, the same consensus. Um, we all have a responsibility to utilize the resources available. Oxnard's looking at, um, you know, building out our advanced water purification facility and also building uh, an injection well field where we take that water and put it back into the ground. So that's really our, our, our priority, right? Desal is pretty far down the road because we haven't advanced um, everything we need to do. We talked about conjunctive use. There's a lot more things that we need to do before we even uh, are allowed to look at desal. Great. Tony, anything you want to add besides what you said before about desalinization? I think I covered the Cayuga's perspective on, on desal. Okay, good. I, I, I'll, 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 I'll wrap up desal with these comments, and that is that uh, there are three major uh, challenges with desalinization. 
One is you have to bring in, if you do open ocean desal, you have to bring in open ocean water and you have impacts because all the fish larvae that you bring into the system and there's, so there's an environmental impact. The second is you have to send the brine back out. When you uh, desalinate water, you get fresh water, but now you have double concentrated uh, brine water that's left over that has to be sent back out to the ocean. And so when you send that back out to the ocean, it can sit on the bottom, create a dead zone and, and cause problems. And the third thing is uh, the environmental impact of all of the energy it takes to desalinate the water. So uh, I would offer to you that today in Southern California, two of those issues have been, can be fairly easily addressed. And I shouldn't say easily, can be addressed. And that is, if you use renewable energy, uh, then you don't have that much of it, you don't have the greenhouse gas emissions. So soon we ought to be able to uh, power uh, desalinization plants with renewable energy. The second thing is the outfall of this, they have found in the Huntington, I mean in the Poseidon uh, project that's been operating for five years now, they just went down and did the study, they found no significant environmental impacts at the outfall because they now take high injection jets and they shoot the brine lots of different directions into the current uh, coming along, and that's diffused the brine enough that it hasn't caused a major problem. But what the Coastal Commission still has a problem with is the intake. And so they put very high requirements. They say, if you want to have an intake that's going to have this kind of impact on fish larvae, you have to do some major things like with, with wetlands and all of that other stuff uh, to make up for uh, the potential uh, kill that you, you have. Uh, that is why I, I asked for it and we've got that million dollars for the Coastal Commission. What the Coastal Commission wants to find are where are the places where you can not do open ocean, but you can do the water right at the edge where you get the water from these subterranean areas where you don't have fish larvae in them. They will identify those and, uh, in this study and then we'll see. But one of the things that I hope that Senator Lamone and I can work on is you have to find reasonable ways to get the cost of desalinization down if it's going to become um, essential for us in the long run. And it, it seems to me the question is not if, but when uh, we're going to have to have that as one of the resiliency options that we have. We don't want to build desal for all of our water supply. You just need to build desal as a backup, as another resiliency option, so you have this baseline that you can turn on if you really have uh, the crisis hit. So with that, I'm gonna read these questions and I'm gonna let this woman, you're gonna be on. Okay, all right, so let me just do these questions really quick so everybody hears them go out there. Um, and I'm gonna jump over the questions that, uh, 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 that have been done. So uh, reclaim sewage, uh, somebody, uh, somebody is really uh, concerned about the city of Ventura on the reclaimed project um, and uh, wanting to make sure that it's gonna go into the ground because they don't believe that you can uh, do it without uh, doing that. I'm not asking you to answer that right now. I'm just letting you know uh, that's a question that came up. Uh, a couple of people asking about rainwater capture and can we do more with rainwater capture uh, out there? Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, then Lake Casitas, a uh, question about the diversions from, from the Ventura River to Lake Casitas. Are there ways to improve that, uh, uh, that diversion um, technique? And then they make this reference about something that happened a couple of years ago that they weren't happy about. So Mike, that's a question that'll, that'll show up uh, out there. Again, we don't have time for everybody to answer all these. Um, Cayegas is installing desalters. Uh, what's the timeline uh, for and what, and how many desalters have to be installed for it to make a real impact? Um, and so that's a question out there for, for Cayegas. Um, and some more uh, desal questions. Um, and uh, why haven't businesses in agriculture been required, not asked, to cut back? Um, and uh, uh, I think that they would probably, uh, so that's, that's a question for everybody, but County of Ventura and Fox Canyon may talk a little bit about what the plans are for cutting back um, in, in terms of that, if, if any. Um, and uh, so I answered those questions. Oh, are there rebates and educational resources for gray, gray water reuse, right? So you may want to check with your local agencies. A lot of them have that um, in terms of that. Uh, and there was one other one. Um, oh, people concerned about 
ex people concerned about the pollution of this groundwater, if this groundwater is going to become more and more important to us, what are we doing to make sure that we don't have uh, pollutants in there, fracking, gas, uh, drilling techniques, et cetera, um, that are out there? So a wide variety of questions, not necessarily that all of these people uh, have to answer them, but um, uh, you guys uh, did handle uh, so many things well, and, and so I'm glad we were able to not put you on the spot on the housing one. But I'm gonna let just one person and I hope you're the best spokesperson for the people who want to talk on the other side. But so I gave you what people were saying. Yes, wh why housing? So let's let's let you and I'll let you come on up to the microphone. All right. If you would, you like to do that? You sure you don't want to say that to the microphone? <laughs> Thirty seconds. Thank, thank you very much, ma'am. I am going to. Um, I'm a. I, I really appreciate, I mean, it's important to have, have heard that point of view. I'm gonna, I'm gonna respond just a little bit as one of the elected officials in the room to the issue about the low income people in the middle class. I think that, uh, I, I think for a lot of people in the state legislature, we don't want to hollow out the, the middle class. And I'm certainly not suggesting that. Um, I am, I, I think that there are so many things that we can do, but this growing income inequality in the United States is what's hollowing out the middle class. And this growing income inequality, and it is very clear to me that there is 
re, there, there are resources at the top of the, of the food chain that if spread more equally, the middle class would be in much better shape. And to me, that's the solution. So I'm not, you know, and we can get into the whole issue of taxing and all that other stuff. Um, so we could have a big philosophical conversation about that. But I, I did want to respond that it's not, uh, I, that comment does not mean that I view the legislature or these any of these districts, if they come up with those kind of programs as trying to hollow out the middle class, there are other ways that, that you can do that. With that, um, we, uh, we essentially are done. I would, if, if there was somebody that wanted to give a 60 second response on the, um, the only issue I'm looking for is if you want to give a 60 second response to the issues about why allowing building, um, even though we have a water crisis. Because I, I presented what the proponent's point of view is, and it, but it doesn't look like, yeah. So do you think you want to respond about why you shouldn't allow the building because of all that? I'm going to narrowly have you do that. Ma'am, it's not you, it's the woman behind you. She, she thinks she can do, answer, answer that. Great. Thank you. Great. So I'm going to end this with 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 just one thing, and uh, we'll have a we'll have another one of these. I'm going to ask this gentleman right here. Would you stand up, please? Right, Fred Ortiz. And I'm going to ask that woman back there, Lisa Burton. Would you stand up, please? Right. Okay. And the reason is, um, you know, I mentioned in 1992 we did the desal campaign uh, out there, and if we would have done it, the desal plant back then would have cost $35 million for the whole thing. $35 million, we'd have desal, um, then you would have it. But that campaign only put out one brochure. And Fred Ortiz brought that brochure here tonight. And Lisa Burton is the woman who made that brochure. And here is that brochure, right? Um, so, and all of that. And, Lisa and I worked together on that brochure. What's that? It was our very first brochure, right? I mean, and I look at it and I'm kind of embarrassed a little bit, you know, but, but it was the best we could do. So anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's hope that the spirit of collaboration that I think we heard a lot of here tonight will uh, continue uh, as we move forward. This is not an easy issue. It's not a, an easy topic. Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid I'll, I'll cut a whole bunch of other people off. Um, Yeah, I, I what? Sure, well, me too. Me, me too. And I'll tell you, the when I saw the when I saw the price, ex, 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 excuse me, when I saw the price of the desal plant recently, I was just shocked. I think it was two hundred and seventy-five million dollars. I'm going, what? You know about? I hope I'm wrong. I hope there's something else. What were you saying, ma'am? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't approve. I, I don't approve those. You can talk to your city council members. That, that, th those are the people that get to do that, right? Hey, folks, I'm going to say thank you very much. But I'm happy to. I'm happy to take you. But... You mean rain, cloud seeding? Yeah. Cloud seeding is, is really complicated. I, I do know that. And I don't know a lot more than that. Right. You're welcome. Yeah. Isn't, that a, isn't that a kickback? Yeah, yeah.